Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kyra Mann, CEO of Mito Action, and it is noon, so we're going to go ahead and get started. We thank everyone for joining us today for today's expert series presentation. We hope everyone's doing well, your families are all safe and healthy as we're all trying to navigate these crazy, crazy times. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on the Mito Action website in the coming days. If you are joining us via phone, I would encourage you to follow along with the presentation slides that can be found on our website at www.mitoaction.org slash resources slash medical cannabis. If you're joining us via computer, you should see the presentation on your slide or on your screen, excuse me. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen on the menu bar. And we will do a full Q&A at the very end of the presentation, but please feel free to submit those questions during the presentation. If you're calling in via phone, feel free to submit your questions to us directly through email at info at mitoaction.org and we will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. We are excited to have with us today, Dr. Fran Kendall. Dr. Kendall will discuss medical cannabis and mito, historical perspectives, mechanisms of action and other need to knows. Dr. Fran Kendall is one of the pioneers in the fields of mitochondrial medicine and is a Harvard trained board certified clinical biochemical geneticist who founded the very first clinical mitochondrial disease program in the United States. Over decades of a career specializing in metabolic mitochondrial and inherited disorders, she founded one of the first commercial laboratories focused on rare metabolic and mitochondrial disorders. Pioneered telemedicine and private practice in rare genetics by founding VMP Genetics, which has branched into three divisions, including direct patient care, education, and physician-to-physician -physician support. Dr. Kendall was the head of genetics for a large hospital system, has authored chapters on mitochondrial medicine for medical texts and numerous research articles. She lectures at medical schools and nursing schools on these disorders, is a frequent guest speaker at medical conferences on mitochondrial disease and autism, and often acts as a medical witness in federal court cases. She is even appeared on national news outlets to offer expert opinions. Dr. Kendall currently sees children and adult patients from around the world in either her VMP genetics clinic offices in Atlanta, Georgia, or by telemedicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fran Kendall. Thank you very much, Kyra, um, for that uh, lovely uh, introduction. So good afternoon. Um, everyone, and, um, and as Kyra mentioned earlier, we hope that during this difficult time, you and your families are safe, and as we all try to navigate through uh, a, a, a challenging situation on, on many, many levels. So today, we're going we're gonna to focus, though, on, on a topic that's a little bit different than what most of us are inundated with right now, and that's about medical cannabis. Um, and I'm going to, to um, as Kyra mentioned, and as you can see on this first slide, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of medical cannabis, some of the legalities in terms of what, how they exist right now and what the legal status is um, in the country overall, um, and then uh, discuss the mechanism of action of actually medical cannabis and the different components of medical marijuana. Um, and then it's, it's um, our personal experience in its use in mitochondrial patients specifically. So it's a lot of information. And of course, if you just walk away with a, with a broad understanding of uh, this information, um, then that's, that's all we can ask for right now. So having said that, we will go to the next slide. And this is merely a disclaimer slide that we're all um, expected to do for these type of presentations. The only thing I want to note is I am a consultant for Stealth Biotherapeutics, which is a uh, pharmaceutical company <clears throat> that specializes 
in the development of rare disease drugs and particularly for mitochondrial disease. So I am involved with them and they're currently with their expanded access program to allow a mitochondrial patients uh, access to olanipertide, uh, one of their medications. So let's go on to the Next slide, and again, this is just a, um, another one of these kind of disclaimer slides that we all need to use. And again, we're talking about um, a, 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 a use of a medication or a drug that there are certain legalities around it. Um, I'm presenting the data as best as I know it, but of course, if, if there are concerns for you from a legal perspective, then we would suggest that you seek legal um, uh, advice for that purpose. So. Let's start with the historical perspective of marijuana. Now, again, I don't expect everybody to remember all this information, but the point of it is to show how it's been utilized in the past and, and what's transpired that led it to be um, listed as a Schedule I drug, which it currently still is. So if you look at, at um, literature and writings and, and information that we have, we know that references to medical marijuana and its usage of, of marijuana dates back to the Chinese and Greeks and Egyptians as far back as 1500 BC. So we have records that also note though it first came to North America via Jamestown in the early 1600s. So it was being utilized for multiple purposes and it was added to the U.S. Pharmacopoeia in 1854. It was subsequently removed in 1942, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a little bit, but um, it was recognized as having medicinal purposes back in 1854. Now, it was widely used and prescribed by physicians from the mid-1800s until 1937, and in 1937, their medical cannabis uh, use was burdened by a severe taxation um, implemented by the Federal Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. So that's kind of the, the beginning uh, of the, the end for its usage for those purposes. But jump back to when it was first um, added to the pharmacopoeia in um, 1854. Uh, shortly thereafter, there was the first medical conference on cannabis in 1860. Um, by the Ohio State Medical Society. And then by 1900, more than 100 scientific articles had been published in the US and Europe. So again, you can see that back in antiquity and even um, in the 1800s into 1900s, it was being used for medical purposes. Um, but ultimately, there were there was criminalization um, of the of marijuana use, and that was with the Boggs Act in 1952, um, and then there was another act in, in Narcotics Control Act of 1956, and then Controlled Substance Act of 1970, which formalized the criminalization of marijuana possession or use regardless of the quantity or context and classified it along with heroin as a schedule one substance deemed to be highly addictive and devoid of medical value or safety. Um, and so that is uh, of course the reason why um, it, it, was, it was criminalized and again listed as a schedule one substance because it was considered highly addictive although of course it had been used for medical purposes but I, I my presumption is is that they were concerned more about the recreational use at that time than any medical value um, then we jump up to the 1960s and um, research identified this psychoactive component of of cannabis, which is the Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoid, or as most of us know it by THC. So medical marijuana was legalized, however, in California in 1996. So that's when people started to reutilize it for medical purposes, which again, as we see, had occurred about 150 years earlier in the country. Um, and subsequently, Colorado legalized it for both medical and recreational use in 2012. Um, now, because 
we are located here in Georgia. I'm going to use our Georgia law to some degree to explain kind of the process and the progression of its use around the country. But we legalized medical marijuana in Georgia on April 16, 2015 for use in eight diseases. And one of those diseases included mitochondrial disease. And I'll touch a little bit on that a little bit more later. But here's a slide I, I um, I composed a, a couple of months ago and went through updated data as best as I could identify it um, and, and kind of summarize some of the legality. So it's, again, from a federal perspective, and remember that's the issue, we deal with it both from a federal perspective and a state perspective, but federally cannabis is still a Schedule I substance. Um, now 10 states have legalized it for both um, recreational use and medical use. And you can see those 10 states listed there to include California and Colorado. Uh, four states have no real state can, uh, cannabis program, but most states have some degree of medical cannabis laws that allows for the use of some form of medical cannabis, but some are restricted to a type of CBD oil only. Because remember, um, there's lots of different products and vehicles that uh, you that you can utilize to use marijuana or medical marijuana, um, and that can be in oil. It can be in the form of, of vaping. It can be form edibles. There's lots of different types, but many programs limited to. Um, the use of a CBD, a high CBD, low THC oil. Um, now, part of the problem with uh, these restrictive programs, of course, is, is the federal law, which dictates, again, and still lists it as a Schedule I substance, which means it's illegal. And so if you don't have a program in your state that grows and distributes it, then in order to obtain the substance from someplace else like Colorado or California, you're technically breaking federal law. Although it doesn't appear that anybody is really actively pursuing folks for, for doing so, but again, technically it is, a, it is still considered um, a, a scheduled one substance. Now there's been some movement and effort um, for the last probably five or six years to modify federal law, but unfortunately it hasn't really gone, um, gone very far at this juncture. So as I state here, there's no unifying federal law regarding the medicinal or recreational use of marijuana. So the CARES Act, of 2019 was introduced into the House in February on February 19th. Um, and there have been two previous versions of it submitted in 2015 and 2017, and they never really went anywhere. But what does the CARES Act of 2019 talk about, or what are they trying to accomplish? Now, of course, we all know in the current environment that we're living in, the chances of this um, getting passed or, or there being a lot of um, focus on this issue specifically are probably uh, not, not great at this juncture. But regardless, it was submitted in February. And, and some of the, the points that it tried to deal with were as follows. So the bill removes restrictions on and creates new protections for conducts and activities related to medical cannabis that are authorized by state law. Um, and it eliminates regulatory controls and administrative civil and criminal pen penalties under the Controlled Substance Act. I apologize, I just realized there is a typo right there. Uh, it's not ACTO, it's ACT, for producing, possessing, distributing, dispensing, administering, uh, testing, and other, you know, other aspects of, of, of medical marijuana distribution in compliance with the state law. So it's basically saying that we haven't revoked it as a schedule one drug, but we're not gonna kind of go after people if they're complying with their state law. Um, establishes a new separate registration process to facilitate medical cannabis research, and then authorizes healthcare providers employed by the Department of Veterans Affairs, so the VA, to make recommendations to veterans regarding participating in state uh, marijuana programs, which had not happened um, to that 
to, to that point. So again, it's trying to prevent the federal government from going after states or individuals or, or groups in states if they're complying with their own state laws with the intent to ultimately <clears throat> to potentially reclassify um, marijuana or at least medical marijuana usage. So let's talk a little bit about our Georgia law. And again, the, the reason for this is not for any other reason than um, we, um, I, I'm more familiar with the law in my own state. And so there's, of course, for each state, there's, there's different laws, different variations. And depending on what state you're in, um, you, you just need to go to the appropriate government websites to get more detail about the state law um, and, and other aspects of it. But here in Georgia, the first law was called the Haley's Hope Law. Um, and it was signed into law on April 16, 2015. So what were the components of the law? It allowed for possession of up to 20 ounces of cannabis oil only with no more than 5% THC with at least the same amount of CBD for patients with one of eight qualifying conditions, including mitochondrial disease. But this law did not establish a cannabis cultivation and distribution program. So what were the initial uh, qualifying diseases here in Georgia? Um, again, there were eight of them, and you can see includes cancer, um, seizures, MS, Crohn's, Parkinson's, and of course, mitochondrial disease. Now, <clears throat> many of you who are listening may be familiar with um, Sebastian Cote. Sebastian is here in Georgia, and he's been instrumental as a parent advocate to get um, medical cannabis and the laws passed here in Georgia. Um, he's both a national and international spokesman and um, an advocate, and if any of you have ever, ever had the pleasure or get the opportunity to hear Sebastian speak, it's, it's well worthwhile. But he jokes a lot and, and says that um, mitochondrial disease got listed in Georgia as a covered entity um, because that the, the nurse who was reviewing the, the submitted um, diseases wasn't familiar with mitochondrial disease and, and he, he said he thinks she was too embarrassed to, to ask about it. So whether that's true or not, but it, it's, it's a funny story. So we were the first state that specifically indicated mitochondrial disease and it was helpful for our local patients in securing um, you know, their cards and, and medical cannabis early on, because not all of them had seizures, although a good number do. So since that time, we've, we've expanded our law. And again, um, so the most recent is Haley's Hope Act Part 2. It was signed into um, law on May 2nd, 2017. So that was two years later. So we added seven additional conditions. Um, were added to include ASD under 18, so autism for kids under 18, AIDS, peripheral neuropathy, Tourette's, Alzheimer's, um, hospice patients, epidermolysis bullosa. So um, they're just, we just expanded on those additional, the, those initial diseases. Um, so there, it also allowed for allowing uh, res uh, reciprocity for ca cardholders from other states if with Georgia mandated qualifying conditions for up to 45 days. So if you came into the state, you had one of the qualifying conditions, um, you could get it in the state based on your, your other card. And then eliminated the original one year residency requirement to register in the program. So again, you didn't have to prove you were a resident for a year before you could go and apply for the card. So the most recent, uh, uh, modification of the law occurred back in um, one year ago on April 17, 2019. So what's important with this is it's setting up the framework for cultivation and distribution within the state. So the law allowed for two class one licenses and four class two licenses for growth a cultivation and then the distribution licenses to pharmacies and uh, retail 
uh, locations. When I last spoke to Sebastian about this, he said that they, there was a committee that was still in the works. And you can see it says there's a seven member committee to draft the rules, regulations, and award the licenses, and that's still in process. Um, and so, it allows the commission to purchase low THC oil from other states and also requires all products to have third party lab testing. So it is moving forward and expanding not only the individuals who can get access to it, but also um, the, the, the uh, growth in distribution so that we can provide it to our residents without potentially breaking uh, federal law and allowing for easier access. So it moves at a snail's pace, but it, it is moving forward. So just a few comments about the low THC oil registry here. It's overseen by the Georgia Department of Public Health. Patients, of course, must have one of the qualifying conditions in an existing relationship with the doctor treating the condition. We have to, we as the physicians have to um, submit a form um, to the state to allow the patient to obtain the registry card. Of course, this is just details for my local patients if they're, um, they're interested or, or Georgia patients in general. Um, and then there's a process and the, the card is then um, You know, you download the forms, they have to be notarized. Again, we have to provide um, the information back to the Department of Public Health. Generally, within about two weeks, they will contact the patient or the family, and then you have to go and pick up the card. At, there's 18 statewide offices, so you have to have a picture ID. Um, and there's a $25 fee to obtain the card upon pickup. So that's not, I've, I've heard from other folks in other states, they, there's, there can be hundreds of dollars of, of registration fee. Um, so we, we've kept it fairly low for our, um, our local residents. The card is good for two years. Um, the state here requires that we as the physicians who have written for the card um, have to provide them with updated forms twice a year um, that provides basic data to them. Um, it includes things are, are, is the patient still using it? Have they um, developed any side effects or problems? You know, those type of things um, that they're just looking to make sure and culling the data to make sure that there doesn't appear to be any, any problems with the use of, of the, um, the CBD uh, THC oil. So, what is what is our overall experience been here in Georgia? Um, so, as of a year, almost a year ago, um, almost thirteen thousand patients were registered. And based on the review of the data from the year before, the following are the conditions that were most often registered: were seizures, cancer, multiple sclerosis, and Crohn's disease. So, again, how many of those seizure patients are mito patients? It's not clear, but a good number of the, the mito patients with seizures do. Um, you know, are, are often classified under the seizure disorder uh, classification. So that's been our experience. So again, um, we started out five years ago with a fairly restricted law. Um, it was challenging uh, for patients, but it's been expanded. And now the, the goal is to grow and distribute. Sebastian had told me that he had hoped that that was going to happen within a couple years. And again, given the pandemic, that may be delayed, but they had hoped by 2021, but I suspect that will be delayed by a year or so. So that's, again, that's our experience in every state's a little bit different, but that's just to show that the progress in the, uh, in the last five years. Now, other states are, are, have moved more quickly. Um, other states are, are more, moving more slowly, and there's lots of different factors that contribute to those um, individual state decisions. Now, let's talk a little bit, now that I've overwhelmed you with the legalities of it, a little bit about the mechanism of action of marijuana. Now, again, I sometimes I, I have to be more mindful, say marijuana and medical marijuana. It, it, the difference um, is, is that 
some people, if they're using marijuana for recreational purposes, may use some of the same products that people do for medical marijuana purposes. But um, when people are using medical marijuana, it, what I mean by that is it's, its use is being um, entertained for the purpose of, of, of treating medical issues, whether it's seizures or pain or whatever the case may be. So whether it's medical marijuana or recreational marijuana, there's still the same mechanisms of action. Now you may have different side effects based on what's in the product you're using. So let's talk a little bit about all those various compounds. So cannabinoids are the chemicals found in the cannabis plant. Um, now the human body contains two forms of receptors for cannabinoids. CB1 receptors are most abundant receptors in the brain and CB2 are expressed in immune cells where they play a role in regulating immune function and inflammation. So humans have several naturally occurring cannabinoids known as endocannabinoids um, to include amantamide um, and that stimulate these receptors. So there are over 80 cannabinoids known as phytocannabinoids found in the cannabis plant. So basically you have a medical marijuana plant or you have a marijuana plant that has many different chemicals in it, but the best known um, and the most psychoactive is THC. Now psychoactive, of course, but gets translated into, you know, lay terms means getting you high, changing your thought process. So THC, THCA, which is a, a, a similar compound to THC, but doesn't have the um, psychoactive component to it. And CBD are the most widely used cannabino cannabinoids for medical purposes. So what are these different compounds these different cannabinoids what what kind of action do they have now <clears throat> again we all know whether from personal or friends or family or just watching the news or reading that THC has a, the psychoactive component that um, modifies our thought process but medicinally it can be used as a muscle relaxant pain reliever appetite stimulant and anti-emetic, which means it, stop, it helps with vomiting. Um, so THCA, as I mentioned, is a non-psychoactive form of THC, and it is, it's used for anti-inflammatory, anti-proliferative, and anti-spasmodic effects. So anti-spasmodic is more for GI issues. Now CBD, or cannabidiol, is primarily used for seizure control, and it has no psychoactive properties. Now there's other things that CBD are used for, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute, but that's something we're all familiar with, and that's the reason I brought that up. So again, these are the three compounds that are used most often in medical marijuana products, and they are some of the effects that they have. And so those effects are going to vary depending on the product and the amount of the different compounds in the product. So there's four categories or groups of cannabis products. So let's talk about those so that you can kind of organize those in your, in your head and, and understand um, when we're talking about cannabis, we're, we're, what are they? So there's over-the-counter products that anybody can get a hold of, and they're classified as hemp. And that simply means they have less than 0.3% THC in them. Then there's medical cannabis products. And as I already said, they have, there's multiple different products and distributors, and they have varying percentages of any number of cannabinoids to include CBD and THC. Now, some of you may not know, there are actually three um, FDA approved cannabis products. One is now Epidiolex that we use for seizures, but there have been a couple of other products that were approved back in the 80s, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those 80s and 90s. Um, so Epidiolex is not the first cannabis product that has gone through um, trials and is FDA approved. And then there's, then there's legal recreational, depending on the state, or illegal, quote, street marijuana. 
Um, and it varies, but on average, the amount of THC in recreational marijuana is 20%, with some strains having up to 34% THC. Now, if you've never used medical marijuana, you don't know anything, or marijuana, or you don't know anything about it, um, just for comparison, similar products in the 1960s and 70s generally had no more than 3 to 4% THC. So you might hear that these products that are available now are, quote, much stronger, and that's what they mean. It has far greater amounts of THC in it than the products that were that people generally used back in the 60s and 70s when its usage um, started to, to increase. So what are some of these medical cannabis products? And there's multiple distributors of medical cannabis products and examples include Haley's Hope and Copper Mountain. Now, there are many different products. I'm not vested in these or any other ones. I don't own stock or otherwise, but these are just an example that I'm familiar with. So a lot of the people in, in the Southeast tend to use Haley's Hope um, and, um, and then and Copper Mountain as well. But again, there's lots of different products out there. Um, and it can be challenging as a, as a parent or a patient to, to kind of muddle through all these and what do you use and not do. There's a couple of of websites that can be helpful to provide families with information. One is Realm of Caring, and that's a Colorado-based um, group manned by nurses. Um, there's Flowering Hope, um, that's also Colorado-based. And here in Georgia, we have Georgia's Hope. So, you know, I'm sure every state has their own um, different websites and, and, and foundations, but there are some of them that you can certainly um, look into. So what are the, the um, what are the FDA approved cannabinoid medications? So um, here's the three, dronabinol, nabinolone, and cannabidiol. So again, as I mentioned, a couple of these have been around for a while, so I'm just gonna briefly touch on this. So the brand name for this medication is Marinol. So again, some of you might be familiar with this and, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the, on the um, you know the biochemistry of this, but it is a um, it's an it's it's an isomer and it's a compound in the same formula but with a different arrangement of the atoms and the molecule and different properties of THC shown to be chemically identical to plant derived THC. It was approved in 1985 for the treatment of chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting in patients lacking adequate response to existing antiemetics. So if somebody was on chemo, they were on Zofran or Phenergan or anything else that, that might help, they were not uh, responding to it, um, that they, were, they, they could use Marinol. Um, it was then approved by the FDA in 1992, so it was, its use was expanded for anorexia and cachexia. So you know, poor intake, and cachexia is just body wasting where you just have massive weight loss in AIDS patients. And it's classified um, as a Schedule II substance, and it is administered in um, oral capsules, and there is an oral solution. So it is a, a Schedule II substance. I have some, a few patients who use it um, for their severe nausea. Um, it, you know, a lot of, a lot of Mito patients can have things like gastroparesis and other GI problems that lead to um, severe nausea and vomiting issues, and they don't respond to Zofran or um, to, to Phenergan. And so I have used it successfully in some patients. So again, this is a medication that has been around for quite some time. Now, Kazimet is another of the FDA approved. It's a THC analog that is chemically similar, but again, not, not identical to e, uh, THC. It was approved by the FDA in 1985, again, for the treatment of chemotherapy-induced refractory nausea and vomiting, and used off-label for analgesia. Um, it's considered more potent than Marinol. It's also a Schedule II substance. And, and this is how it's available. It's also in capsules and, um, and um, you know, smaller dosing for pediatric patients. So I have not used this specific um, product, 
Again, I've used Marinol in just uh, one or two patients. I, I have not used it routinely. Uh, um, of course, it is still a Schedule II substance. It is THC-based, but, um, but as I indicated, it, it is proven to be helpful in patients who don't respond to some of the other medications. Now, the last FDA-approved cannabidiol brand name is Epidiolex from GW Pharma. Most of you, many of you might be familiar with this product. Um, it's a highly purified form of CBD from plant extract. It was approved by the FDA in 2018 for patients over two years of age with Dravet or Lennox-Gastau syndrome, their severe seizure disorders. It's classified as a Schedule V substance, so it's not a, a highly addictive compound. Um, another Schedule V compound you might be familiar with is, is gabapentin. So Schedule, I mean, Schedule I is highly, is supposed to be highly addictive um, and, and without medicinal purposes. Um, and so again, that, that's where marijuana is currently classified, um, but so is heroin and things like that. Um, so it is available in an oral solution of 10 milligrams per ml. Uh, with a maximum dosing of 10 milligrams per kilo twice a day or 20 milligrams per kilo per day. Uh, there is some reported dose-related um, liver function test increases. Um, and so, you know, that's just something that has to be monitored. So again, there are three medications, two THC-based, one CBD-based, um, the most recent only around for a couple of years, the other two for, you know, 30 years or longer for, um, and they are basically used for cachexia and, 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 um, and nausea and vomiting in, in, in AIDS or primarily cancer patients at this point. So let's talk a little bit about CBD and seizure management. And this is an original study um, that kind of came out at the same time as our our uh, law was passed here in Georgia. So um, it was in April 2015, and this data was presented at the American Academy of Neurology meeting, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they looked at 213 children and adults with 12 different forms of severe epilepsy, treated for 12 weeks with daily CBD. Um, 137 of, of completed the study, and of those patients, there was a 54% reduction in seizure activity, Seizures fell by 53% in the 23 patients with Drave. Atonic seizures were diminished by 55% in the 11 patients with Lennox Gastel. So 12 patients discontinued the, the cannabis due to intolerance, sudden drowsiness, diarrhea, fatigue, um, and some decreased appetite as primary causes or reasons for discontinuing it. So, um, so you can see there's there's a marked reduction in seizure activity, and of course, this was the one of the preliminary studies that that ultimately led to the FDA trials and ultimate um, approval of Epidiolex for management of seizures. Now, let's talk a little bit about a mito um, function and and cannabis, and so. Um, there's not really much data out there, so I'll just briefly talk about this, and then I'm going to talk about our specific experience with medical cannabis, and um, and then I'll, hopefully we'll get through that in the next 10 minutes or so, and then we'll 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 open up for questions. But the SA, um, FASEB journal article published in April 2017 determined that the bioenergetics of brain mitochondria are impaired by THC. Now. What I'm doing is I'm showing some, some kind of, um, you know, differing information. So this article is saying, okay, the brain is impaired negatively by THC. But in the next article, and I saw a couple of different articles that stood on both sides of it, um, in research published in OncoTarget in July 2017, so around the same time, the authors suggested that THC may inhibit the progression of Parkinson's disease by promoting mitochondrial biogenesis. So again, these are kind of conflicting information and data. Um, my point is, is that we don't have a clear handle on um, medical cannabis or cannabis in general in terms of its, fun its impact on mitochondria. So there's a couple of different opinions on that. So, you know, what did we see um, 
you know, what do we see in our patient population? So let me share a little bit of that. So right now, as of a couple of months ago, we have, we have about 50 cards for high CBD, low THC oil um, that are active. So over, over the course of the last five years, um, you know, we've had some people who have used it and, and didn't think it helped them that much. So they, they discontinued the card. Others have continued it. Others are more recent and are now just trialing it. But at, at right as we stand now, we have about 50 people. But we have many people who use just hemp oil. So this, this hemp, this oil that any of us can get through any number of avenues, whether it's the local CBD store or whether it's um, online. So it, uh, many, many patients, have, and we don't have a good handle on that because they don't need cards or otherwise. And so a lot of people may mention that they use it when they come into the office, others don't. So, but um, a lot of people do use uh, hemp-based products. So what are some of the general clinical improvements uh, with cannabis we've seen in, um, in our mito population? Um, so we've seen a marked improvement in seizure control in many patients. So we've had patients um, that have been on multiple anticonvulsants and, and, the, um, and they are, they've been weaned off of multiple medications. Maybe instead of five or six, they're on maybe one or two. Um, so that's been very helpful. There's been a considerable reduction in anxiety. So I'm not here to say that if you're a patient with an anxiety disorder and you're on Zoloft or something like that, that, that um, cannabis is going to be the answer. But if you deal with more mild anxiety, a lot of people will say that it's enough for them to, um, to be able to function a little bit better, better not deal with that. Uh, I've certainly seen an increase in focusing on mental clarity. Um, and, and improve functionality in, a, in adults and skill attainment in children, um, especially kids with, with autism. Uh, I've also seen an improvement in gut uh, dysmotility, particularly leading to reduction in constipation in some patients. Again, I'm not here to say that if you've got gut failure, got this complete gut dysmotility, that it, you know, CBD is going to be your answer. But in some patients, it definitely leads to either reduced need for other. Um, you know, whether it's Senna, Miralax, other, other treatments. Uh, improvement in pain management, including symptoms of peripheral um, uh, neuropathy. So I think in general, though, I, I kind of put some, you know, asterisks there that pain resolution is limited with hemp products and often requires higher amounts of, of THC. So that's been my experience personally, that when people use pure hemp products, pain management is more difficult, um, and then often they need a higher amount of THC in order to control um, those pain symptoms. So uh, the next slide is going to talk about a couple of individual patients and their patient experience. So patient one has a Paul G disease and had regression, ataxia, and tractable seizures. And he, uh, this patient was weaned from four out of, of, of five anticonvulsants with a reduction in seizure activity within several weeks of, of implementation. Now, he wasn't weaned off of four out of five after a couple of weeks, but that's the overall course. But there was a marked reduction in seizure activity well, within several weeks weeks of introduction. So patient two, autism, seizures, language, re language regression, noted improved seizure control and recovery of language. So use of more, more um, verbal language after introduction of, of CBD. Um, a lead disease patient and seizures so showed marked improvement in seizure control, pain relief, and increased GI functionality. And patient four was an adult with myopathy, which showed improvement in muscle and nerve pain. So again, these are just four examples of many patients who have shown improvement, but these, these kind of um, display the broad spectrum issues that I've seen improve, which range from anxiety to uh, obviously seizure control is the big thing, but I've also seen, you know, other um, of skill attainment and then pain management depending on products used. And here's a few others. Quickly, we'll go through that just for 
time's sake, I don't want to run out of time. Again, you can just see a couple of these folks have ASD and seizures with becoming seizure free and some increase in skill attainment, um, particularly with, with patient seven who showed a decrease in stimming behaviors. So it was more behavioral um, improvement for that individual. Now, one thing I do want to make an emphasis on or talk about here is, um, you know, there's a lot of questions about, of course, cannabis use in general. And obviously there's, there's a lot of talk about opioid analgesics. And, and this, is, this uh, study in JAMA six years ago now talked about opioid analgesic overdose um, in comparison to the use of medical cannabis. And, and essentially um, what this found was, we can, we can jump down to um, the bottom part here where the findings. And analyzing death certificate data compiled by the CDC states with medical cannabis laws had a 20, basically 25% lower mean annual opioid overdose mortality rate compared to states without similar laws. Um, in addition, the data showed that the reduction in mortality per state increases every year after passage of um, of the medical cannabis law, typically reaching 34% after five years of legalization. The thing to remember is, you know, what, what kills in opioid use? Opioids uh, attach to the brainstem and they, they cause a reduction in breathing. And that's why people who, t who um, when they uh, overdose, they stop breathing. Um, and that's what Narcan does, it reverses that process. But we have no receptors on the brainstem um, for um, any of these, uh, these cannabinoids. So what that means is that we can't overdose from it the way you can with opiates. So um, this is just an interesting state at a, a, a study to, to look at some of this data about how the use of, of medical cannabis has actually helped with some of this opioid, uh, the opioid issues that exist. So let's just spend, um, a quick minute or two talking about dosing and safety in, in, uh, information. Um, and so dosing of cannabis is based on patient weight and type of cannabinoid to be used. Um, they're generally administered several times per day. Um, drowsiness, fatigue, agitation, and diarrhea, as I mentioned previously, are the most common side effects. Although 10% um, of patients on high dose THC can experience seizures. So if you are, a, if you have a child with seizures, you, you are a seizure patient yourself, you have to keep that in mind um, that sometimes more is not necessarily better. So if it's too high, people can experience just the reverse with increased seizure activity. So cannabinoids can be administered by smoking or using edibles, oils, tinctures, topicals in the form of patch, uh, you know, patches, gels, sal salves, or creams. But again, remember, different states have different laws, so different products um, are, are only legal in certain states. So you have to be familiar with your local laws in regards to what products you can, you can use. So how do you procure a safe cannabis product? Well, that, that can be challenging, but of course, families um, and, and your contacts um, can can help you with that. So, uh, you know, in chat rooms and other places where people discuss this type of stuff, they can say, okay, you know, a lot of people use this product and this is what they, they you know, this is what they do. But you have to find a legitimate vendor. Know that the lab is testing the cannabis product because there can be other compounds in these products and know which laboratory tests are needed to ensure a safe product. So, and when you're talking about product testing, some of the things that are important are, um, you know, how concentrated is the product? You know, is there fungus, mold, bacteria, or yeast in the product? Uh, remember, when you remove these cannabinoids from a plant, there is an extraction process, and we have to use chemicals to extract them. But sometimes those chemicals, residual chemicals, can be left behind. And so you want to make sure the product is as pure as possible. Um, and then heavy metal testing. If it's grown outdoors, does your cannabis product have residual arsenic? mercury or lead in it. So most of these um, cannabis plants are, are grown in very controlled environments. But it, you know, if, if something is being grown outdoors, the cannabis plant leaches its, its uh, 
there's a, a there's a scientific term for this, but they, they, it leaches substances out of the pro, uh, out of the ground, so it can concentrate things like um, arsenic and mercury in it. So you have to you have to make sure that you don't get a product that's not been vetted for these purposes. And and it is challenging because there's so much stuff out, out there. Every every other day, there's somebody cropping up with another. Um, you know, store or product or otherwise, but use each other and, and talk to each other about that. So, so that's all I wanted to talk about today. Um, it was kind of a wide reaching discussion about medical cannabis ranging from the laws in the past, the current laws, our experience with our Georgia law, certainly talked about the mechanism of action for the different um, cannabinoids and the ones that are used most frequently, the categories and our personal experience with its usage. And so I hope that's given you some, some basic guidelines and a better understanding of, of medical cannabis and what my experience has been here with my patient population. So I appreciate your attention and I think we've got a little bit of time for, for questions. So I will turn it over back over to Kyra. Thank you, Dr. Kendall. That was um, a lot of really great information. And so, yes, we have quite a few questions that have come in. So I'll just go through those and, and we'll try to get through as many as we possibly can. Um, can you explain the difference between CBD oil and hemp oil? So, so it, 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 it's challenge. It's a little bit diff difficult to, to, um, to explain that, but, and it's, Part of the reason certain products are, are called hemp is it's, it's just because the amount of THC it is, has in it. So you can have a CBD product that has, um, that's considered CBD, but it's considered a hemp product if it has less than 0.3% THC. So if you get a high CBD low THC product that's allowed like here in Georgia, you can have up to 5% THC, but that would not be considered a hemp product because it, it's, it's about the amount of THC it has. So again, anything under 0.3% is hemp. Anything over that would be considered more of a medical marijuana or a marijuana product, but they both have CBD in it. Okay, great. So in when, when you're taking CBD oil, typically how long does it take for you to see an impact? So at what point do you say, you know, I've been taking it for two weeks and uh, maybe I notice a little bit difference, but like, is it something you should continue for a 30 day period or longer? And just how long of a chance do you give it before you really can start to see benefits. Okay. Some people will have reported even just in a couple of days, but generally uh, realm of caring. And again, it's a really good organization. There's a lot of information on their, their website, but they talk about two to four weeks. And I think that's reasonable. Um, so, you know, if you've been taking it for six months and you don't see a lick of difference, well, it's probably not doing anything for you. Um, but again, like I said, I've, I've definitely seen within a couple of days, but I would, I would give it at least a minimum of two weeks. But after four weeks, if you're not seeing anything, it's probably not doing for you what you had hoped it would do. Okay. Um, can you explain when you talk, when you say a treatment is a Schedule II substance, what does that mean? A Schedule II substance, so, so drugs are classified and, and regulated depending on, on a, a number of different things. Um, with, with scheduled drugs are, are drugs that have physical and, and uh, you know, um, neurological and other dependency or, or problems with potential abuse. So for example, the higher the schedule, the more, more likely the drug is to have um, addictive components where people can abuse it. So, so again, there's, there's the five schedules. Schedule five is the lowest. Schedule one is the highest. So schedule two basically means there, there are medicinal purposes, but you can become addicted to the component of the medication. So in, in the case of, of Marinol, for example, it is a Schedule II drug. It is a derivative of THC. And so THC can be 
considered addictive. So that's what it means. And again, th there's varying degrees of it. And, and addictive, remember, addictive doesn't, doesn't mean necessarily that you're going out getting heroin to shoot up. It can mean you're your body is dependent on it. So some of these things like gabapentin, for example, it's schedule five. People don't go around, you know, abusing gabapentin, meaning they're not, you know, it's not like a heroin addict is looking for gabapentin, but if you've been on it a long time, your body is physically dependent on it. So you have to be weaned off of it. So again, it's not just about abusive, you know, using it, but it's also about your body being physically dependent on it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the next question is my medical, and I think you may have answered this already, but let's take a stab at it. My medical marijuana doctor tells me that CBD derived from the hemp plant is not as beneficial or does not have, have the same health properties as CBD derived from the medical marijuana plant. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think again, it de it depends on what you're using it for and, and what what you know a, a a hemp product. Now there are hemp plants, but but again, hemp products mean any any product that has less than zero point three percent THC. So there's different varieties of of the cannabis plant, and, and some have m more. You know, they breed them. That's why the the the, the the marijuana now has much higher amounts of THC because they breed them for that purpose. So it's really about what you what you want to use the product for. Um, and so if you're if you've got, you know, if you've got a lot of pain, you probably don't want to use a hemp product because it, it has so little THC and THC is better for pain. So I don't know if that really explains it, but you, you have to you have to recognize what is it that you're using it for, um, and that will dictate really what kind of product you you is is best for you. Do you have a recommendation of a safe level of THC to start at if you're using it to for sleep, like to fall asleep through pain? Um, like what? Where do you start, and how do you know? Because right when you go, you buy CBD oil, you buy it from the dispensaries. It's not necessarily regulated or, I mean, I guess you would say you, it's definitely, you would want to consult with your doctor before you take anything. Yeah. Um, but if somebody's walking into a store to get CBD for the first time, like how do you know where to start? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and, and Kyra, that'll depend on what state you're in and where you're walking into. So for example, here in Georgia, because we don't have medical cannabis distributors at this juncture, if you go into a CBD, like there's a, there's a store not that far from my office that says CBD on it. And if you go in there, the only thing they can, they can um, sell are products that have less than 0.3% THC because um, it's illegal otherwise in the state of Georgia. But in Colorado or California, where you've got both recreational and medical cannabis available, you can get products that have tons of THC in it. And I think you, you have a good starting point to remember is that we met that the that the, the marijuana that was available back in the 60s and 70s that people would smoke for the purposes of getting high, mind you, had four to five percent. So you don't want to go into one of these dispensaries if you live in Colorado or a state where you have more options and get something that has 20% THC because you're going to be stoned out of your mind. Um, so, you know, it really depends on what you want it for. If that's the intent, well, then it'll work. But um, so, you know, again, remember, and there's no easy answer because remember with, with medical cannabis, we're doing this backwards. Normally, uh, uh, something ha is deemed to be have medical purposes, and then it goes through all the FDA process, and then we as physicians are taught about it and learn about it, dosing and all that stuff. This is completely backwards. So it, it's, it, it's confusing for patients and for physicians, but you know, if somebody has pain and they want to be able to sleep more, and let's say you live in a state where you can get access to a product that has more than 0.3% THC, you have to keep in mind that 4 to 5% in the past can make you high so you're gonna you're gonna have to 
titrate it. You're going to have to kind of, you know, make a guess, but I, I wouldn't use, you, you know, I would use a lower THC product and see how you respond to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so th we've had quite a few questions come in regarding the impact of medical marijuana and the liver and how it m metabolizes in the liver and d does it affect the potency of other drugs? Mm -hmm. Well, it can because it gets metabolized through some of the same pathways that other like neuropsych or, or anticonvulsants are, are metabolized. So, so sometimes what they've recommended in the past, and I don't know about epidiolex because I, I, I didn't look at the, um, other than the dosing, I didn't look at uh, what they're otherwise saying, but I know even before that got approved, we would tell people not to take like, you know, um, Kepra at the same time that you take your your um, your CBD oil. So usually it would be like two hours before or after, so they're not being metabolized at the same time because they can up and down regulate anticonvulsants. So you definitely want to talk to your 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 prescribing physicians about that, um, and come up with you know a regimen. And I think Realm of Caring does provide some of that data as well. But yes, it is it is a known problem. And the last thing you want to do is take something like, you know, CBD oil and then upregulate, you know, one of your anticonvulsants, like, you know, and then end up toxic on it or downregulate it and you have more seizures. So you do have to be mindful of that. And, and what about, so say there's no other drug involvement that you're taking, do patients, like a patient with a, a child with cold G, have to be concerned about liver involvement or it, it causing damage to the liver or anything like that? Well, there is reports um, of some increase in, um, you know, in LFTs. Um, I'm not sure how high that is, but I'm going to assume that, you, you know, it's probably, you're going to probably have to monitor it more than you would in a typical mito patient. And, you know, a lot of times if, you know, if LFTs are fine, I wouldn't measure them more than once or twice, even in a whole a year. You know, again, depending on what their baseline liver involvement was, if they had Paul G. But if they do, I mean, they're gonna, they're just gonna have to monitor it more frequently um, and see. I, I don't know. To be honest, I don't know that we have, you know, we really have any real data yet. I mean, it, it meaning, you know, the the drug is Epidiolex has been approved now less than two years, I guess. And like, you know, the number of Paul G patients taking it, I mean, you're not, you're not talking about thousands. So, um, so I don't know, I haven't seen any reports of anything to date, but, but other than you can get an increase in LFTs. So I would probably, I guess, I'm just guessing, I would probably monitor at least initially every three or four months. Okay. Great, that's helpful. And we'll do one last question because we just, um, it's just past one o'clock. Uh, do you see any potential medical benefits for medical marijuana for patients with FAOD? With, with I'm sorry, Kara, I didn't hear the end with what? Sorry, fatty acid oxidation disorders. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I think depends on again depends on their symptoms and problems so you know fatty acid oxidation defects depending on the specific type of fod they can have many of the same problems as a mito patient they don't have seizures very often unless for example you know i have some kids who have you know presented with hypoglycemia and, and develop brain you know uh, brain damage because of it and then they have a seizure disorder so that might be helpful but but there's a they have muscle pain and aches and those type of things certainly again they may have some hypotonia with bowel involvement and gi issues so i mean i, th I think it's 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 reasonable to think that they may respond for for some of the other purposes and i i think um, it's, it, you know, depending on their issues and problems, if they've got anxiety, it might be helpful. If they've got some GI issues, it might be helpful. But uh, I think for the most part, um, the patients that I've seen that respond most are, are probably, you know, again, the seizure disorder patients. That's, that's without a doubt. Um, kids with autism, because it does seem to help with some of their anxiety and some of their focusing 
and then um, and then maybe some some pain issues, some muscle pain and aches um, with 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 the kids and the adults. So again, if you've got some of those issues, it's worth trying it. But as an entity in and of itself. I don't, it's not going to help in terms of the pathophysiology of the fatty acid oxidation disorder. It may help with some of the secondary symptoms. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kendall, for taking the time to answer the community's questions about medical cannabis. I know that it's, it's always a hot topic. Um, and so this gives some really great information for patients to take back and consider and have conversations with their doctors about what's best for them. Can okay, you continue? Great a champion for the MITO community, um, and especially at MITO Action, we are truly grateful for you and all that you do to support this community. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You're very welcome, and, um, and my best to all of you as you all stay safe and we walk through all this together. So it's been my pleasure to be with all of you today. Thank you so much. So just okay. a few few reminders before we sign off. The, today's presentation is recorded and we'll be posting it on our website in just a few days. Um, and so feel free to go back and listen again and share with others who may not have been able to join us today. So thank you to everyone for joining us for our monthly Mito Expert series. You'll be able to find all of our presentations on our website at www.mitoaction.org. And I would just please wish everyone stay safe. If there's anything Mito Action can do to support you, especially now, this is such a difficult time for everybody, don't hesitate to reach out to us. So enjoy the rest of your day, be safe, and we look forward to having you join us again next time. Thanks everyone.